Okay, committee, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. The only item on the agenda today is to work a bill HB 2433. And with a motion on HB 2433, Representative Long. Mr. Chairman, I move we pass that HB 2433 out of the committee. Favorably. Do we have a second on that? Representative Dodson seconds it. Committee, we um, put this off from a couple of weeks ago because we had a couple of conflicting uh, interest between the parties of the uh, that this could affect. And so we asked them to get together and come up with the proper amendment to amend the bill so that everyone was more or less on the same page. And I believe we do have that. We do have an ag agreement that the amendment that we're going to pass out is acceptable to both sides. And each side would be a neutral then instead of a, a pro well, then we'll have a proponent of neutral. Representative Clayton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, would it be all right if prior to the amendment being passed out, or maybe maybe we can just have an explainer as to what the base bill is and what the amendment would do? Because it's been about a year since we've had this hearing, I'm only just now digging up old stuff, and I want to make sure we're all as informed as possible. Right. I'm going to have the reviser explain the bill as it would be amended. And so can you pass that out and then explain, uh, you can, you can explain the base bill if you'd like, or you can explain the base bill after these changes. As he's passing that out, committee, the reason for this amendment was to make this bill s similar in nature or exactly like the federal bill that's being negotiated as well. And so they just basically took the federal language and massaged it into our statutes. And that's what the amendment is. And I'm going to have the reviser explain. Representative Clayton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know, um, Mr. Chair, you mentioned that this amendment is the result of a compromise between the two sides. Could you just remind us um, who the two sides were? Is it the Sharks and the Jets? Or, you know, what are we working with here? Yeah, the skins and pants. <laughs> it was uh, uh, a negotiation between um, Amazon and, and Walmart. Thank you. Okay, so I didn't know if it was between Amazon and Walmart on one side and perhaps uh, small sellers on the other side. Nah? Okay. Noted. Thank you. Charles Reimer. Uh, chairman, members of the committee, I think probably the easiest way to go through this would be to sort of follow along the balloon and the federal bill um, at the same time. 
because the balloon, as you'll see, is quite involved. There are a lot of changes uh, in trying to sort of weave in the federal language into 2433. So I think um, that would probably be the easiest way to do that. So uh, may, may I start with that then, Chairman? That, that's, that'll be fine. Okay. So uh, first of all, if you'll uh, turn to the bill, uh, you look at, uh, first of all, of course, just as initial background, this bill, of course, is about um, requiring online marketplaces to um, verify information and provide certain information with respect to high volume third party sellers of consumer products on those online marketplaces. Um, and again, what we're trying to do is make turn 2433 primarily into HR 5502. So looking at HR 5502, you see the first section there is um, it, about uh, um, requirements of uh, information. And if you turn to the balloon on page two, I think probably that's the easiest play to start because, you know, then you can just kind of follow along. So you'll see on section two on page two of the balloon, that's line 15, that corresponds to where we're starting out there on 5502, um, you know, where it says in general, right? So the changes to the bill, you can just follow along there. I'm starting with line uh, 15. Um, You've got a change there. Uh, the, the federal bill uses the term online um, marketplace uh, platform instead of online marketplace. Online marketplace in the federal bill refers to the operator of the online marketplace. So you'll see those changes throughout. Um, there's a change with respect to, um, uh, you know, just right from the federal bill. I uh, see a uh, balloon there, the um, shall require, the online marketplace shall require that any high volume third party seller um, on the online um, marketplaces platform uh, to provide the online marketplace with following inform information within 10 days. Now that's a change. The bill requires that the information be provided within 24 hours. So we're making 24 hours into 10 days. Um, the, the second, the um, paragraph one there, um, we're, that pertains to the kind of information um, that must be uh, provided. So uh, the bill is a little bit more detailed. Um, you'll see that we're striking some information there, some lines there on uh, 19 through 21, and we're just requiring the bank account number. Um, and you can turn the page. You'll see that on the second page of the federal bill, um, that's what they require, a bank account number there. And, uh, just under the bank account, and then in general, and then you'll see they require a bank account number. Um, moving on down on the balloon uh, to uh, line 27 of page 2, uh, in uh, subparagraph B, we've got a change there that's from May to ensures the ability to, and... Uh, and you can see that language again in the federal bill um, in uh, what is um, BB, labeled as, as BB in that paragraph. You can see similar language there. Um, moving down to uh, information required from the high volume third party seller, if the high volume third party seller is an individual, um, we're striking. Um, some language from the bill that is a little bit more, again, a little bit more detailed. The bill required a government-issued photo ID. Um, that's stricken. Uh, the only requirement um, under the amended, uh, under the balloon, is 
um, that there be a uh, uh, the name. And if the uh, high volume third party seller is not an individual, um, there are a few changes there. Uh, we're striking the physical address. Um, and uh, in that section, it um, it's required in in uh, in the next paragraph, and uh, and and the rest of it is fairly similar. So, turning to page three, and you can see page three on the federal bill starts. Um, if you look down um, where it says notification of change, annual certification. Um, so that's where page three starts on the uh, of the balloon um, starts on the federal bill. So the first uh, um, the first part there is um, um, the uh, time frame in which notification has to be given. Um, instead of, uh, or actually, we have to switch around here because um, there, there was a request that the, the order of these paragraphs be changed. So what you need to do is, is I apologize, look first at uh, line 16 on page 3 because that is now paragraph 1 and that corresponds to the notification of change in the federal bill. So uh, again, um, with respect to the the timing of um, of uh, notification, uh, there's a little bit of change in language. It's instead of an annual basis, it's um, it, periodically, but not less than annually. Um, and then you know we've got a. Uh, a change with respect to the timing. Instead of three days, it's ten days. Um, and you can see that those changes follow the federal bill um, on the bottom of that page. Like I said, notification of change, annual certification, and then um, on the top of the next page. So if you read that federal bill, um, you know, that's what this portion of the balloon is seeking to accomplish. The uh, provision with respect to verification, um, that's on line nine of the balloon. Um, so you can see that in the federal bill, there's, there's a line that says verification. And then it talks about how the online marketplace is to verify the information collected. Um, and again, we've got that change to from three days to uh, 10 days. Um, and um, I think that's probably the, the main change there. Uh, moving along to disclosure. Um, that's section three of the balloon, page three, section three. And you can see that on the federal bill, um, subsection B, disclosure required. Uh, that's on the federal bill on the same page we were on, just a little bit further down. Um, so we've got some additions there. Um, the disclosure requirement is only for um, third party sellers with an aggregate total of 20,000 or more in annual gross revenues on such online marketplace and that uses such online marketplaces platform. So uh, we've got that addition from the federal bill. And we've got a little bit of changes in where the information is to be disclosed for consumers. Um, so, um, you can see that um, you can see that in lines 33 through 35 of the balloon. And um, 
so that's been changed um, to uh, basically again follow the federal bill and, and if you turn the page of the federal bill and you can if you can see there's some yellow highlighted text so that's the page that we're on um, you'll see that highlighted text is actually um, where the information is to be disclosed it's uh, changed a little bit um, there's not a requirement that it be on the product listing page um, so following down uh, there's an, an exception um, for partial disclosure um, of information um, in both the federal bill and, and in the balloon. Um, and I think if you look at um, that's at um, B1 on page 4 of the balloon. So you can see there that we have a pond request. There's uh, the high volume third party seller can, re you know, request a, just a partial disclosure of, of information. And um, there's a change there from that the high volume third party seller has to, instead of demonstrating to the online marketplace, uh, you have to certify. So a little bit of change there. Um, and then it, it and again, it kind of follows the, the federal provision. Um, it, a little bit of a changes to the kind of information that needs to be provided. Um, um, then, um, on page four, um, C, oh, there's also, a, a, you know, that provision on uh, B2 with respect to um, if the online marketplace becomes aware that the high volume third party seller has made a false representation. Um, there's a little bit of a, a change there to follow the federal uh, provision. Um, so you see the change there that the uh, um, they have to provide the seller with um, notification and an opportunity to respond. And again, it's a 10 day time period instead of that three days that's in the bill. Subsection uh, C on the bottom of page four of the balloon um, uh, discusses uh, disclosure by the online marketplace to consumers. Um, and uh, uh, suspicious marketplace activity, and that's pretty much the same as as a federal provision, uh, which you can see um, on uh, in uh, paragraph three reporting mechanism. And then the uh, compliance. Um, provision is a little bit different. Um, you'll see in the federal bill, there's a compliance provision that, um, that uh, is uh, inserted um, right there on the top of page five. So that, that pretty much follows the federal language. And again, uh, that strikes um, strike some language in the in the bill and inserts that provision from the federal bill the um, the rest of the bill if you look at the federal bill the the language is stricken there it's a number of items from the federal bill that were not included what what is included in the balloon is um, similar to to way it it was uh, when introduced is you have the 
uh, attorney general attorney general providing enforcement uh, with uh, kind of through the Kansas Consumer Protection Act and you can see that on page five at section four um, there are some exceptions there there's a, a specific um, prohibition of uh, the private remedy that is um, otherwise available under the Consumer Protection Act um, there's a also a prohibition that no criminal penalties pursuant to the Kansas Consumer Protection Act are to be imposed. Um, but otherwise, in general, the Attorney General has responsibility for enforcing the act um, through the remedies and procedures of the Kansas uh, Consumer Protection Act. And the, the bill, the act, is made a part of the Kansas Consumer Protection Act. There's a, a limitation on uh, Section 5, um, sort of um, a uh, preemption provision that um, no um, city, county, township, or other political subdivision of the state shall establish, mandate, or otherwise require online markets at places to verify information. Um, and uh, finally, there's also Section 6. If you see that uh, balloon, it, um, that box on the balloon on page five, that's just a, uh, um, a savings clause. Uh, if any part of the bill is found to be unconstitutional, then the other parts could, you know, if they could take effect without the unconstitutional uh, provision, then uh, they would still be in effect. So again, um, the concept is to basically follow HR 5502 um, and all these changes are made with that um, intent in mind. Sorry about that. Okay, so just as a, as a reminder, this bill was brought to us by uh, major retailers that sell large items and they have a theft issue where people are walking out with high dollar items and a lot of them it's, it's just becoming more and more uh, prevalent especially now when you see these smash and grabs going on um, and this bill was brought in order to help uh, identify those people that might be stealing the items and trying to sell them online it's for new items only is that right Charles, it's new items only, and there's a certain amount that have to be sold before this information is requested. Right. So a definition of high-volume third-party seller, um, which, you know, is the party that these requirements apply to, you can find that on page one of the balloon, um, subsection B, lines 14 through 19, and you'll see that um, you have to, within a continuous 12-month period during the previous 24 months, entered into 200 or more separate sales or transactions of new or unused consumer products for delivery in this state, resulting in the accumulation of an aggregate total of 5,000 or more in gross revenues. So that when, when a seller on the online platform hits that mark, that's when, when the provisions of the bill would apply to that high volume third party seller. Okay, and, and this will only apply to sites that actually do transactions, not like a Facebook marketplace where you're just introducing a buyer and a seller. Is that correct? Um, so again, turning to the, the definitions, um, you've got online marketplace in line 20 on the first page and that uh, was changed again to mirror the federal bill to be a person or entity that operates a consumer directed electronically based or access platform and then you've got kind of a list of items there it has to include features um, that allow for facilitate or enable third-party sellers to engage in the sale um, of consumer products it uh, is used by um, one or more third-party sellers for such purposes and three it has to have a contractual or similar relationship with consumers governing the use by consumers of the platform to purchase consumer products um, so 
um, I guess it, it would be up to the Attorney General to sort of decide what platform would fit that definition. But, you know, it seems to be more aimed at what would, what would uh, one would anticipate, you know, large um, online uh, platforms like Amazon and that kind of thing. Committee, any, any questions? Representative Probst. Thank you. This is a lot to digest on a bill that we heard a year ago, but there's a couple of things I, I noticed in here I want, I want to make sure I'm square on. On page one, we're defining a high-volume third-party seller as somebody who sells 200 separate transactions in a year, basically. Here's this other part on page three, uh, I think in section three, uh, that brings in a number about aggregate total sales of twenty yeah, thousand dollars. Referring to the top of section three on page three, lines thirty-one to thirty-three, in there, where there is an additional requirement with respect to certain disclosure requirements, and that, as you know, pertains to um, a third-party seller. Um, with an aggregate total of 20,000 or more in annual gross revenues on such online marketplace and that uses such online marketplaces platform. So that $20,000 applies to the marketplace, not the individual. No, it, it applies to the, uh, to the third party seller with respect to certain requirements in that section three, certain disclosure requirements. So I have one level of regulation if I have 200 cells and another level of disclosure requirements if I have $20,000 in cells. There is that difference in the... Okay. Representative Long and then Dodson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ch Charles, can you enlighten us a little bit about the congressional bill? By that I mean you've got 30, 40, possibly 50 states passing their own state bills to prevent this stolen merchandise from being remarketed. But if H.R. 5502 was passed, wouldn't that fix the whole problem? So what is the status of that? Why do we need state regulation versus the federal bill. Do you have any idea where HR 5502 is? That's today? an excellent question. Unfortunately, I'm not sure. I, I would think, I, I believe the conferees know exactly the status of where that's at. Uh, would one of you guys like to address that? Yeah, Mike O'Neill, uh, Walmart. The, the status of the bill is is that it, it hasn't gone anywhere and is not likely to go anywhere. I don't know whether too many of you follow what goes on or doesn't go on in Congress. Uh, so just because it's introduced doesn't mean it has uh, a chance of passage. However, um, what what we've learned in the years since the bill this bill was introduced is that the states have realized two things. Number one, that there would be, it would behoove them to reach agreement on some form of language so that the states that do move forward are not creating a patchwork quilt, given the fact that it is unlikely that Congress will uh, pass the legislation. To answer your question, if Congress passed it, yes, this would be a moot question. But the retailers involved uh, nationwide have pretty much come to the same conclusion that it's unlikely. But if the states are going to move forward, then this, this federal language is probably the best. And that's why you see us pivoting from last year's bill to the federal model. Does that help? Then, uh, Mr. Hickman, and then he's got a, Representative Long has a follow-up for you. Uh, Matt Hickam, representing Amazon. Um, the, the 
federal bill was the result of some high-level negotiations between big box retailers and e-commerce sellers like Amazon and eBay and Etsy and such. There was, a fe there was an agreement agreed to last November that, that they agreed to some certain language to address this issue. And then that bill was actually put into another bill and 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 the most recent bill is actually in a conference committee right now and so you know as as the previous speaker mentioned you don't know what's going to happen as far as congress and bills moving forward but the status of that language and that and that federal bill it is in a conference committee bill right now and it's uncertain when they're going to address that representative one is there a worry that as these bills are enacted state by state, that they're all a little different and you guys are going to have to do business a diff little different in each state? To, I mean, it, does it create a problem that each state may not look the same? Um, Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would say that any time you have bills in multiple states, there is a concern of having a patchwork uh, effect of companies having to deal with, with different legislation. Um, our, our compromise with this was to attempt to have the state bill mirror the federal bill as much as possible. Representative Dodson. Now, this may be not be relevant, particularly after uh, Representative Long's question, but I noticed in uh, 5502, you start on the bottom of page 5 and, and then go forward. Uh, all of that is stricken that has to do with the Federal Trade Commission. Is there a rationale for that? Did, as you said, did it, is it going to appear in another bill, and does it have impact on what we're about to do here? Charles Reimer. Um, so I apologize. I thought you were directing that to the uh, conferee, but yeah. So with respect, yeah, there is a, a number of uh, material that was not included um, in the amendment. To, um, and I, you know, what was your, you specifically mentioned one aspect of that, and what was that? Well, if, if you look on 5502 there at the bottom, Charles, at, of page 5, it starts with uh, C, which is enforcement by Federal Trade Commission, and goes on for three pages right. of strike. Yeah, so um, the enforcement provisions um, in the amendment um, are, are different um, in the amendment that's before you. Enforcement is by the Attorney General, uh, sort of through the Kansas um, Consumer Protection Act, and the remedies and um, penalties of the Kansas Consumer Protection Act apply to violations. So, and, and so that you know that is a substantial difference with the federal bill, um, I guess. But you know that. Um, that was a mechanism for enforcement with respect to, to you know, our state, to Kansas, to, to have the Attorney General um, enforce it. Thank you. That makes sense. Representative Highland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, picking up on Representative Pro's question, it's 5,000 on page one and it's 20,000 on page three. And I did not understand the explanation of why the difference. Revisor Rammer. Um, yeah, and as to why there's a difference, I'm not sure I can speak to that. But, you know, there is that difference, and that pertains to um, certain disclosures that a high-volume third-party seller uh, has to, to provide um, consumers. Um, so, uh, I, I guess, you know, why that, uh, you know, I think it does follow the federal bill, but why there is that difference, um, I really can't answer that. Perhaps the conferees could explain that. 
So is there a le different level of disclosure when you hit the 20,000 total sales or revenues? I think we should all be one. <laughs> Um, I don't believe that there is sort of a second tier. Um, so, you know, with respect to the disclosure requirements of Section 3, um, which is on page 3 of the balloon, um, line 31, um, again, you know, there is that specific provision that that applies to a, the third party seller with that 20,000 or more in annual gross revenues. Um, and I don't believe that there is sort of an alternate um, disclosure provision. OK, so on page one, then the 5,000 or more is a definition of a high volume third party seller but they're not required to disclose anything until they hit a 20,000 mark. Is that kind of how that reads? Well, uh, no, the, the, there are requirements that apply to the online uh, marketplace. Uh, the, I mean, the high volume third party seller as defined in the definition section. It's just that with respect to um, certain disclosures to consumers um, that are laid out in section three there um, that, applies to, uh, you know, that sort of different definition uh, with the 20,000. So um, there's that distinction. That, is that cleared up, Representative? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I guess, so some of the requirements, for, for example, for providing information to the online marketplace would apply. Um, with respect to providing um, some disclosure provisions to consumers in Section 3, um, it only applies to the, the um, you know, the higher tier with the 20,000 or more in annual gross sales. I go on. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, that's clear as mud. Thank you. Uh, in the federal bill, it states uh, a tax ID number, and in this balloon, they're asking for bank numbers. And I'm not going to give you my bank number, but I'll give you my tax ID number, and that would suffice, I think, to weed out some of these folks who are trying to sell stuff. And with that, I'm done asking my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Revisor Reimer. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, you know, if the question is why is that change there, um, you know, there just are some changes to to some of the language and that comes out of the federal bill. So I, I don't really have a response as to why that there's that difference. Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Where exactly are we in terms of motions? We're still reviewing the amendment. There's just a motion to pass the bill. Um, a suggestion. Uh, I suggest that tomorrow morning I ask the chairman of the Federal and State Affairs Committee to have the committee introduce a new bill in the form of the balloon and that at your discretion we hold a new hearing on that bill. I just It's been too long ago. There's too much new ground, and I just think to do it right, to actually hear from conferees wouldn't kill us to start over. I'd be happy to ask, again, the Fed and State Committee tomorrow to introduce a new bill consistent with the balloon so we can get started on that as the blueprint, get rid of the old bill. That That's a suggestion. Is that a motion? A substitute motion? Well, I don't know what motion I would make. Um, I, I'll, I'll move to table this matter, and then we'll go from there. How's that? Second. Second by Representative Propes. Any discussion on tabling the bill and having it reintroduced? Hmm? No discussion? Oh, it's non-debatable. Is that non-debatable? 
Yeah, she's not debating, just questioning. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd like to hear from the chair. Is this something that we could reasonably, if it were introduced in Fed and State and brought back to us, do we have a reasonable amount of time to move forward this if this is uh, the will of the committee and chair? We don't have a whole lot on the agenda moving forward, so we, we would have time to do that. And ample time to get it to the Senate if if it uh, was brought on general orders. And one more question for the revisor: just making sure that by tabling it, we're not killing it because we have more time to come back and bring it back up. Is that correct? Just in terms of parliamentary. I think uh, there's a requirement for bringing it back a certain number um, uh, votes that are necessary. Eddie, maybe Eddie can. <laughs> He's looking at it better. So stand by, please. Answer is that uh, the motion to table is non debatable. He's unsure if it takes two thirds of majority to take it off the table. Um, but if, we're, if the intent is to introduce a new bill, it really wouldn't matter. Yeah. All right, so you've heard the substitute motion to table the bill. All in favor say aye. 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 All against. Aye. All against say no. The table, the motion passes. We're going to table this bill. We'll see about reintroducing it in the next day or two. Representative Miller. Uh, can I have the last hour of my life back? <laughs>�����������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������